Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Mark Bollinger and I'm a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague and co-author Joachim Seal and together we will lead you through the highlights of our Utility Scale Solar 2016 report which was released just a few weeks ago. Before we jump in, I just want to note a few things. Um, first, we will save some time for questions and answers towards the end of the hour, so please do feel free to type your questions into the uh, chat or Q&A box at any time during the webinar, and we will try to get through as many of, of your questions as we can. The chat box is probably also the best way to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties, as at least one of us will be monitoring chat throughout the presentation. Uh, finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website within a few days. So this is the um, fifth year that we've done this report, and the basic premise behind the report is that the rapid growth of the utility-scale solar market in the U.S. has resulted in an exponentially growing amount of empirical project-level data that is ripe for analysis. So what we do every year is to gather up as much of this project-level data as we can and then analyze it in a variety of different ways with the goal of identifying key trends in a number of different things, uh, including project design, technology specifications, and project location, um, installed project prices, operation and maintenance costs, uh, performance as expressed through capacity factors, and finally, power purchase agreement or PPA prices. And we'll be touching on all of these things today, uh, primarily with a focus on utility scale photovoltaics or PV, although the report does also cover concentrating solar thermal power or CSP. And if we end up having um, some extra time at the end, I can quickly cover some of that material as well. So uh, before we get into the project level data, let's talk just a bit about deployment trends as a way to kind of set, uh, set the stage. So here we see the deployment history of solar in the U.S. going back to 2007, along with uh, some projections out through 2022 from uh, GTM and SIA's Solar Market Insight reports. Utility scale solar, which is shown here in blue for PV and yellow for CSP, has been the largest segment of the overall U.S. market since 2012 and had its strongest year ever in 2016 when it accounted for nearly three quarters of all new solar capacity installed in the U.S. Now, uh, prior to, this, uh, to the uh, recent Section 201 trade case ruling, the utility scale sector had been projected to maintain its market leading position out through at least 2022, but in light of the recent ITC decision and the ongoing uncertainty over uh, the possibility of future tariffs, forecasts are obviously being revised downwards, and here we've included just one such forecast that was made over the summer, assuming a minimum module price of 78 cents per watt. Now that, uh, that minimum module price may be a little bit different than some of the remedies that are being discussed right now, but it nevertheless suggests that uh, solar deployment could be cut almost in half over the six-year period from 2017 uh, through 2022. So there's clearly a lot of uncertainty going forward, which of course makes uh, uh, projections particularly difficult. Here's another way of looking at historical solar deployment, uh, in this case placed within the broader context of additions of all different types of generating capacity to the U.S. grid. In 2016, uh, solar was overall the largest source of new capacity added to the U.S. grid, accounting for 38% of all new capacity. And the utility scale sector alone accounted for 26% of all new capacity. And you can see that this is a trend that's been building for a few years now. As a result, some states are now approaching or even exceeding 10% solar penetration. Um, the numbers vary a bit and the relative state rankings also shift around a bit depending on whether you calculate solar penetration as a percentage of in-state generation as we've done in the left-hand side of this table or instead of in-state load uh, as you see on the right. But in general, these are the top 10 states in the U.S. in terms of solar penetration. Uh, you can also see that the relative contributions of utility scale versus distributed solar also varies somewhat from state to state. So for example, most of Hawaii's solar penetration comes from distributed solar, 
whereas most of Nevada's comes from utility scale solar. Okay, so with that bit of context, um, I will now hand it off to my colleague, uh, Joachim Seal, who will take you through our project sample, describing what it looks like and then discussing uh, upfront installed project prices as well as O&M costs. But before doing that, um, I just want to clarify that when we are compiling our project sample and gathering empirical data, we focus only on ground-mounted projects that are larger than five megawatts of AC capacity. So just about everything that you'll see from here on out is focused on projects that meet that definition of being both ground-mounted and larger than five megawatts AC. Uh, for those of you who uh, are instead interested in smaller projects or roof-mounted projects, Berkeley Lab does have a companion report series called Tracking the Sun, which you can find on our website. So with that, let me hand it over to Yo, and then I'll be back a little bit later in the webinar. Yo, take it away. Thanks, Mark, for um, this great introduction. Um, my name is Yo Seal. I'm a scientific engineering associate here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I've had the pleasure to work with Mark over the past couple of years on this utility scale uh, report series. And I'm now going to first discuss a few technology trends, then talk about a few pricing trends, and at last, touch briefly on O&M operation and maintenance costs. So first, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the geographic uh, spread of uh, PV project locations. This is a map for 2015. I'm going to update that in just a second to a 2016 map. But what I want to draw your attention to first here is that uh, the color scale on this map depicts the solar resource or the global horizontal irradiance measured in kilowatt hours per square meters per day. And the darker uh, color means that you have more sun available, while lighter color means that it is less sunny. And you also see that we have a couple of regions. We divided the United States into a couple of regions. California stands on its own uh, because of its massive market size. And we have the Southwest, the Northwest, Texas, Midwest, Southeast, and the Northeast. Uh, also, we have a couple of different symbols here. The green diamonds represent tracking projects. A tracking project is a project that has, most of the time, a single axis tracking mechanism that allows the plant to tilt the modules from east to the west over the course of the day to capture more of the sun. And the blue circles represent fixed tilt installations, so projects that do not have that tracking capability. And uh, if I now toggle to 2016, you see that really a lot of new projects came online. 2016, as Mark mentioned already, was the biggest year that we've had so far. Um, in particular, uh, we see a lot of activity in the southeast and um, southwest California. Also, what is now fun to see is that we actually have uh, PV projects in all of our seven regions. So 2016 had a couple of new projects in the northwest for the first time. Historically, we've seen that fixed tilt installations were really in the uh, less sunny regions in the northeast and uh, to some extent as well in the southeast, while tracking historically has been uh, reserved to areas that have had a lot more um, sun, so that was the southwest and, uh, and California. Um, but if I toggle again back and forth a little, you see uh, that a few of the new installations in the northeast and in less sunny insulation areas now have uh, tracking capabilities um, as well. This graph uh, now depicts our overall PV project population from which I will draw a couple more statistics over the following few uh, slides. So in um, 2016, we have now overall um, project population of 427 projects with nearly 16.5 uh, gigawatts. In 2016, new uh, projects represent um, more than, than 7 uh, gigawatts. So in 2016 really was our uh, largest year in terms of our project sample uh, as well. We also distinguish here uh, by uh, regions, so the different colors that you see there represent different regions. California, its market share in terms of annual additions has gone down a little bit uh, since 2014. Um, back then, California really dominated the market with nearly 80%. Now it has halved to about 40%. Uh, nevertheless, 
no state has ever added more utility scale PV capacity than California in 2016 with nearly three gigawatts uh, in that year alone. The uh, Southwest has uh, continued to expand its market share to nearly 30 percent, Southeast um, roughly maintaining its market share, and then a few, all other states as we call it here, um, have uh, increased their market share as well now to nearly 10 percent. And so among those all other states, we have seven new states that added their first utility scale uh, PV projects ever, and that was Oregon, Idaho, Minnesota, uh, Virginia, Alabama, Kentucky, and South Carolina. Georgia has been especially active in 2016, adding nearly 730 megawatts, and that was the second largest amount of new soil capacity among all the states in 2016. Texas was also very active, um, doubling its annual new capacity, and Florida really started a growth spree um, and actually has a lot more solar capacity planned for the coming years. This uh, slide now shows the uh, build-out uh, of our project locations in a, in a dynamic manner. In particular, it shows the actual solar irradiance or solar resource uh, that is used by our uh, PV projects in our sample. And the green bars represent the, the median solar resource of all our projects. And since 2014, those bars have decreased, meaning that uh, the average solar resource that is now getting used by uh, PV plants is less than what it used to be. So because PV prices have come down and PV becomes more competitive, it actually now makes sense to build in less sunny areas uh, outside of the southwest as well. In addition to that, we distinguish here between tracking projects and fixed hole projects. Again, tracking projects are those red dots and fixed hole projects are the blue dots. What is interesting here is that while we've seen for, for a while that tracking projects really use on average more sun than fixed hole projects, um, the upper bar or the upper whisker of fixed hold um, projects has really decreased. So the 80th percentile uh, of fixed hold projects is now substantially lower than what it used to be, meaning that fixed hold projects are really retreating now into less sunny areas, while tracking projects are increasingly um, going on the attack there and are being built in less sunny uh, areas. All else equal, the build-out of uh, lower uh, solar resource sites will dampen the sample-wide capacity factor that we will talk about um, later. This slide shows, again, our overall PV project population and distinguishes by tracking versus uh, fixed build installations and also distinguishes by module types. So we and distinguish here between crystalline silicon modules and uh, thin foam modules. What you can see very well here in 2016 is that tracking just really dominated the overall market, now having nearly 80% of uh, new installed capacity, while fixed oil projects only account for 20% of new 2016 um, project. At the same time, the darker red um, or darker blue uh, shade uh, represents crystalline silicon modules, and you can see here as well that they really dominate the market with 77% uh, uh, crystalline silicon capacity relative to thin foam. We've been able to gather uh, quite a few um, pieces of information about the modules um, on a range of um, projects and among all the projects for which we do have module information. Um, Trina is the largest crystalline silicon manufacturer, followed by Jinko, Canadian Solar, and uh, SunPower, while uh, Fist Solar really dominates the uh, thin foam market as it has over the last years. This slide now shows the uh, ratio between a DC capacity of a project and the AC capacity. So a DC capacity is determined by the um, cumulative amount of, of modules that you have there. And over the past years, developers found it advantageous to oversize the DC module arrays relative to the AC inverter capacity. Um, this then yields the results that you 
are able to boost generation in those hours when you um, have not yet really reached the AC uh, capacity limit of the inverter. So in those shoulder periods are the early morning and evening hours in the summer or just in general the uh, winter, spring and fall when you may not um, reach the capacity limit of your inverter. And so this, this ratio between DC and AC that we call the inverter loading ratio or the IOR uh, has increased uh, over the last years, but um, since 2014 really it has stabilized around 1.3. Uh, Historically, fixed hold projects have had a slightly higher ILR in order to compensate for um, their inability to track the sun. And uh, we see that while the median between fixed hold and tracking installations are having the same ILR of about 1.3, there are a few fixed hold projects out there that have an ILR of uh, more than 1.4. Although it's equal, again, a higher ILR, meaning having more modules per AC inverted capacity, um, should yield a higher capacity factor, as we will um, talk about more later. Now I want to transition to um, the price section of uh, our report. We've been able to gather prices for about 60% of all projects uh, that came online in the year uh, 2016, so about 90 projects or so, representing um, nearly 5.5 gigawatts of solar capacity. We know that many people in the industry talk about prices in dollars per watt DC. Uh, however, we prefer to um, denominate our prices in dollars per watt AC, so uh, the inverted capacity, because we think that makes it a little easier to actually compare prices with some other utility scale generation technologies like wind and natural gas. Um, if you use the a uh, higher denominator of DC capacity, the resulting prices are going to be lower. Um, those are depicted here in blue. If you would choose instead the AC uh, capacity denominator, the resulting prices are going to be a little higher. So this just takes some getting um, getting used to, and this explains why, why the red dots are consistently a little higher there. Overall, though, the median prices have uh, fallen uh, steadily over the last uh, years, and 2016 was a year where prices have fallen especially um, to now about the median is $2.2 per watt AC or $1.7 uh, per watt uh, DC. You see as well that the um, project prices actually have quite a spread, and we'll dive a little uh, further into that. The lowest 20th percentile now um, has a uh, price of $2 a watt AC or $1.5 per watt DC. A word of caution here, all these prices refer to projects that uh, were built and completed in the year 2016, so it's backwards looking, uh, and the prices here are not necessarily indicative for projects that are currently being um, built in the year 2017. This is a different way of looking at the distribution uh, of prices um, where we have the project share on the y-axis and then different bins of installed prices on the x-axis. Uh, the different colors represent different years. So on the very right side, you see uh, in purple 2012. And so the mode or the peak of this distribution with each year is shifting to the left. left to lower priced uh, system in 2016 shows, on the one hand, um, concentration of projects that uh, at, at lower prices, um, at about $2 of what AC now, and uh, at the same time it shows that the distribution of prices of all has uh, gotten um, uh, more concentrated. So we see less of a um, price dispersion as we've seen in, in the past years. Here we uh, distinguish uh, prices by uh, projects, uh, those that have fixed hold installations and those that have a tracking uh, mechanism. And uh, historically, tracking projects were a little bit more expensive. We still do see this in 2016 as well. 
But as I previously mentioned, the overall dispersion of prices has really collapsed uh, already in 2016, and so the price premium uh, on upfront capital cost of tracking projects has gone down quite a bit uh, as well. So it's now um, just 15 cents a watt or so, according to our empirical um, findings. And this cost premium really has come down over uh, the last years. Important to note here as well is that this upfront cost premium is usually compensated by having more uh, generation and so on a levelized basis. Um, those tracking projects, uh, you know, fare at least as well. We also have tried to look at economies of scale for a number of years, and uh, this year we've actually been able to find some uh, slight economies of scale, uh, but it is important to note that A, the economies of scale between a 5 megawatt project and a 100 megawatt project are very slight and just a, a few cents a watt here according to our findings, and B, that um, this finding is quite sensitive actually to how you define those um, uh, category. So, you know, take these findings here um, with a little bit of a grain of salt. But uh, we found now some modest economies of scale um, where projects more than 20 megawatts were um, had a price of uh, $2.3, what I see, while um, larger projects between 50 and 100 megawatts had a price of $2.1 per watt AC. The last category on the very right side of projects larger than 100 megawatts uh, seems to have actually higher prices uh, than the smaller um, counterparts. And this may be um, due to the fact that uh, we are indexing our projects by project completions. And so very large projects may just have had longer developing uh, times and so had the contracts for the um, engineering procurement and construction contracts um, dealt uh, or negotiated at an, at an earlier time period uh, when prices were still uh, higher, or they may just um, face greater development, regulatory, and interconnection costs that could outweigh any economies of scale. But overall, we have only a sample of 15 projects here, so um, there needs to be some caution in interpreting these findings. Here we distinguish the project prices by uh, region, and um, 2015 project prices are compared to 2016 prices, 15 in red, 2016 in blue, uh, and compare that with the national median prices of uh, 2016. As previously mentioned already, the uh, overall dispersion of prices has gone down in 2016, so most of the regions are uh, quite close to the national median now. Uh, California seems to um, be a little bit higher priced, uh, while the Midwest uh, in particular is um, quite low priced in comparison to the national uh, median. Those price differences can in part be driven by the technology ubiquity. Uh, so in California, there are maybe more tracking projects than in the Midwest, and other factors may include labor costs or the share of union labor, land costs um, or the soil conditions, or to what extent you may face a high snow load and thus need to have higher um, or more stable uh, racking systems, or just the overall balance of supply and demand for um, the capacity to build the new projects there. Most of our prices are um, total system um, prices divided by the total system capacity, and so that is what we call um, a top-down um, price finding, where we just we may not know exactly what uh, components yield this total system price, but we know roughly what the total system price uh, was. In comparison to that, there are several models out there that do a bottom-up um, cost modeling. And we've compared now our top-down uh, findings, uh, our empirical findings, with a couple of these model um, results from NREL, BNEF, and Green Tech uh, Media because they do their pricing analysis in dollars per watt DC. We've converted our prices here into dollars per watt DC 
uh, as well. And in general, especially in comparison to the annual results, we find that our um, top-down empirical prices are uh, quite close. The GDM prices are substantially lower than ours, um, but that may be due in, uh, to some extent because they only represent turnkey EPC costs and exclude uh, permitting interconnection transmission costs, uh, development overhead fees, and also um, profit margins. Overall, overall, it's quite difficult to really ensure good consistency of scope in the cost categories among those um, at different uh, estimates. Um, and one uh, piece of information that is always difficult to, to find out is um, whether or not those model estimates refer to projects that are currently under construction or that have been completed by a specific operation date. I will now conclude uh, with uh, some um, brief data on operation and maintenance cost. Overall, this uh, cost data is uh, still really difficult to um, get, and we have to rely on FERC Form 1 findings here for the most, uh, or filings for the most part, which not everybody um, files. In 2016, we've been able to increase our sample uh, slightly and now have data here for pg and &E, PNM, Nevada Power, Georgia Power, APS, PSEG, and Florida Power and Light. Um, and the, the graph there in the top uh, shows on the left axis the O&M costs in dollars per kilowatt AC year, and on the right side in red in uh, dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, overall, in 2016, uh, O&M costs were about $18 per kilowatt year, or $8 um, per um, megawatt hour. And there seems to be a slight increase um, in cost, but uh, given our small sample size, I wouldn't give too much attention to that. What may be more interesting is that the whiskers that represent the least cost and the highest cost utility uh, actually have come down a little bit. So the overall dispersion and the O&M costs may be going um, down. And with that, I would like to hand it over uh, to Mark. Okay, thank you. So I am now going to move into capacity factors and then also PPA prices. So here we see the uh, capacity factors of 260 projects uh, totaling more than 8.7 gigawatts of AC capacity that was installed from 2007 through 2015. And because we need a full year of data to calculate capacity factors, the sample does not include any projects that were built in 2016. So the sample ends with, two, with uh, 2015 projects. As you can see, the overall range of project level capacity factors is quite large ranging from 15.4% all the way up to 35.5%. And a good deal of that variation can be explained by the three primary drivers of capacity factor that are broken out on this graph, uh, namely the average quality of the solar resource at the site, uh, whether the project tracks the sun or is mounted at a fixed tilt, and finally the inverter loading ratio that, that Yo described earlier. And the relationships here are largely as you'd expect to see. Um, as you move from left to right, a higher inverter loading ratio typically results in a higher AC capacity factor. And the same holds true when you switch from fixed tilt to tracking and also as you move from a lower into a higher uh, solar resource bin. There are, of course, uh, a few individual outlier projects here and there that you can see. And um, in some cases, that might reflect curtailment of specific projects which is embedded within these numbers. Uh, for those of you who prefer to think geographically rather than in terms of insulation, uh, this graph breaks out the same capacity factor data on a regional basis. Um, the overall regional ranking shouldn't be too surprising, with the Northeast and the Midwest having the lowest capacity factors, while the Southwest and California have the highest. You can also see the tracking provides more of an incremental benefit over uh, fixed tilt in the higher capacity factor regions over on the right than it does in the lower capacity factor regions on the left. And as a result, we tend to see a lot more tracking than fixed tilt projects in those high capacity factor regions, while the reverse holds true in the lower capacity factor regions. <clears throat> okay, this graph breaks out average capacity factors by project vintage and you can see a steady uh, improvement from 
2010 vintage through 2013 vintage projects, driven by increases in all three of the variables shown, uh, whether it's average insulation, uh, as denoted by the GHI number, or the prevalence of tracking, or the average inverter loading ratio. Um, since 2013, though, we've seen average inverter loading ratios hold more or less steady, while the two other drivers, uh, tracking and GHI, um, have moved in opposite directions, resulting in more or less stagnant capacity factors among 2014 and 2015 vintage projects. Again, um, as Joe mentioned, the lower average GHI since 2013 reflects the geographic expansion of the market outside of California in the Southwest, which is a good thing, uh, while the increase in the prevalence of tracking is also, I think, a good thing and reflects the increasing competitiveness of tracking technologies, even in those lower insulation regions. And finally, for capacity factors, um, we've now amassed enough project level data that we can start to look at performance degradation over time. And as you can see here, uh, whether you're looking at the median, the simple average, or the capacity uh, weighted average indexed capacity factor here, uh, there definitely seems to have been performance degradation over time and at a rate that is greater than the half a percent per year number that's commonly built into PPAs, and that is also indicated on this graph by the, uh, the straight dashed red line there. That said, uh, there are a number of important caveats in order here, uh, and the largest of those is that we've made uh, no attempt whatsoever to weather correct the data for interannual variability in the strength of the solar resource at each site. So it could very well be that some of this apparent degradation is simply reflecting several consecutive summers of below normal insulation in the southwest, for example. Uh, curtailment is also embedded within these numbers, and as we'll see a bit later, curtailment has increased in recent years, at least within the largest U.S. market of California, uh, so that could be uh, coming into play here as well. Uh, and finally, uh, you're not necessarily looking at a consistent sample from year to year. Uh, instead, each year of the graph reflects a slightly different project sample as projects uh, uh, drop out. And uh, you can see that the sample size drops off rather quickly over time, reflecting the relative youth of the utility scale market here in the U.S. Uh, all of these things, uh, either individually or together, could be complicating the picture somewhat and making performance degradation appear to be larger than it has actually been. Okay, turning now to PPA prices, um, the combination of lower installed prices that uh, Yo covered earlier and higher capacity factors that I just ran through has enabled PPA prices to fall rather dramatically over time. Um, each bubble on these graphs represents the levelized PPA price from a single contract uh, with the size of the bubble tied to contract capacity and the location of the bubble on the graph indicating the levelized price at the date of contract execution. The price levelization takes into account any escalation rates and time of delivery factors, and all levelized prices are expressed here in real 2016 dollars. The top graph shows our full sample going back to 2006, while the, the uh, bottom graph focuses on just the, the, the most recent period um, since 2015. Although, uh, although California in the Southwest uh, clearly dominated the sample up through 2013, uh, that is, you can see a lot of uh, kind of gold and green bubbles there in the top graph up through 2013, um, in the past few years, we've seen the market broaden considerably to the four other regions that are shown here. Uh, for the first time this year, we've included Hawaiian contracts, uh, which as you can see are priced at a pretty significant premium to comparable PPAs here on the mainland. Um, the existence of this premium is, is certainly not surprising, but the magnitude is perhaps a little higher than we might have expected. Also new this year, we've got uh, three PPAs that include long duration battery storage, and two of those are, are actually in Hawaii. And as you can see in the bottom graph, um, these three solar plus storage PPAs do not seem to be priced at all that much of a premium over their counterparts that uh, lack storage. Uh, and in fact, we do have a little bit of data on that. Um, the biggest and most recent project uh, uh, located in the southwest, that, that kind of uh, orange shaded circle in the bottom graph, um, 
has indicated that the battery system added about $15 per megawatt hour to the levelized PPA price, which would otherwise have been um, around $30 per megawatt hour just for the solar portion. So I guess in that sense, uh, the premium actually is pretty significant. In, in this case, it's about a 50% premium, uh, even though the absolute magnitude may not seem that large. Okay, these two graphs uh, are really just intended to show a clearer picture of the time trend by averaging PPA prices in each year, which is what the columns here depict. Um, the top graph shows the price decline solely by contract execution date, while the bottom graph shows it by both contract execution date, which are the blue columns, again, <clears throat> and then also commercial operation date, which are the orange columns. Um, obviously, due to the time lag between when a PPA is signed and when a project becomes operational, um, so far the orange bars have really, uh, uh, have really been kind of trying to catch up with the blue bars over time. Uh, there's been a slight uptick from 2016 to 2017, but I wouldn't read too much into that uh, yet, given that sample size in both years is rather small, uh, plus the fact that our 2017 sample includes three uh, rather sizable Hawaiian projects that are clearly uh, pulling up the, uh, the weighted average. But the main point of this slide is simply to illustrate the uh, really significant PPA price decline that we've seen over the past decade. This price decline has obviously made utility scale PV more competitive with uh, other sources of generation, though it's important to recognize that while the price of solar energy has been falling rapidly, the wholesale market value of solar in some markets, or at least in one market, California, has also been declining. Uh, these two graphs here show the same thing, uh, with the only difference being that the top graph is expressed on an annual basis back, back through 2012, while the bottom graph is on a quarterly basis back to, to uh, 2015. In both cases, the uh, dark orange bars show the solar penetration rate within the California ISO market, while the, uh, the lighter, uh, creamier portions of the bars show the rate of solar curtailment. Not surprisingly, as uh, solar penetration has increased, so too has solar curtailment. Uh, the blue circles, meanwhile, show uh, what we'll call solar's value factor, which is defined here as the wholesale market revenue earned by solar generation, given its hourly generation profile, uh, divided by the average wholesale power price across all hours. So in other words, um, given a solar project's hourly generation profile, how much revenue did it earn in the wholesale power market over the course of a year relative to a, uh, let's say, a hypothetical baseload plant generating at a constant output in all hours of the year. And as you can see in the top graph, uh, back in 2012 when solar penetration was only about 2%, solar earned 126% of the average wholesale power price in that year. But just a few years later in 2016, with solar penetration at around 12% now, uh, solar earned just 83% of the average wholesale power price. And you can think of this decline in market value as a, um, a market manifestation of the infamous duck curve that you've no doubt all heard about, where more and more solar generation at midday drives down both the net load and also the value of solar generation at that time. Uh, now, based on uh, data for the first three quarters of this year, which is uh, included on both graphs, uh, we expect this, this value decline to continue in 2017. In the bottom graph, you can see that uh, after a rather dismal first quarter in which solar's value factor dipped to just 38%, um, solar actually held up quite well over this past summer, uh, despite having a significantly higher penetration rates than in 2016. The fourth quarter, however, has typically been a lower value quarter for solar, uh, so I suspect that we will ultimately see the full year number um, drop a bit lower still than, than what's indicated in the top graph. Um, finally, it's worth, it's worth noting and, and emphasizing that California is somewhat unique in terms of its high solar penetration rate and that most other markets throughout the U.S. are not yet grappling with this issue of declining solar value, or at least not, not yet to this extent. So another new piece of analysis that we added to this year's report is to calculate the levelized cost of solar energy, or LCOE, 
at the individual project level. And we do this by bringing together different pieces of empirical data that we collect for each project, uh, including the, uh, the CapEx or installed price data that you ran through earlier, uh, as well as capacity factor data, and then feeding those components into a, a pretty standard LCOE formula. The results are shown here in this graph, uh, plotted by commercial operation date. Although there's a, uh, you know, definitely a wide range of project level LCOEs seen in each year, the uh, three different central measures of LCOE that are shown here, whether it's median, mean, or capacity weighted average, do all show a, a steady downward trend over time. And that trend happens to track the median levelized PPA price, which is shown here by the black line, rather closely over time, uh, suggesting that the market for PPAs has been fairly competitive overall. Now the median PPA price is always uh, a little bit below the, the uh, central LCOE estimates simply because uh, PPA prices tend to reflect the benefit of state and federal incentives like the 30% ITC, while the LCOE calculations exclude all incentives um, other than accelerated depreciation. Okay, I think in, in the interest of time, I'll skip this one and maybe um, very quickly run through s uh, some information on CSP projects. Um, there were new, uh, no new CSP or concentrating solar thermal power projects built in the U.S. in 2016, so there's not a ton to talk about here, um, but we did have a flurry of uh, project build-outs uh, from 2013 through 2015. And you can see uh, on this map here that, with one exception, a project down in Florida, uh, all other CSP projects in the U.S. are concentrated in the desert southwest where the direct normal irradiance is the strongest. Uh, here we see the capex or installed price of these plants. Uh, in contrast to the steady downward trend in installed prices that Yo showed us earlier for PV projects, um, here we can see that there really does not seem to be a trend in uh, the installed price of CSP projects. Um, now granted, we're looking at several different types of technology here, including troughs and power towers, uh, some of which include thermal storage while others don't, and all of this makes comparisons and uh, trend identification more difficult. Here we see the historical capacity factors of the CSP projects, and probably the main story here is that um, several of the newer CSP plants uh, seem to be struggling to live up to ex-ante performance expectations. Um, the two power tower projects, for example, were each plagued by extended outages in 2016, uh, which took a significant toll on their capacity factors. And similarly, the, uh, the single trough project with, uh, with storage suffered some storm damage in 2016 and so far this year has contended with at least one transformer fi uh, fire, um, again, all of which has negatively impacted performance. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the two most recent trough projects without storage um, appear to be performing largely up to expectations. So it's been a, a, a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, finally, here we see the PPA prices of these CSP projects overlaid on top of the PPA prices of um, uh, PV projects within the Southwest, uh, and that's just there for comparison. Um, as you can see, back when these CSP PPAs were signed, they were more or less uh, at the market, given where the market was at that time. But since then, the price of PV, of course, has, has, uh, has plummeted, and CSP has had a hard time keeping up, at least here in the U.S. Uh, there are some projects still moving forward overseas. Okay, uh, so let me now just quickly wrap this up with a bit of a look forward. Um, at the end of 2016, there were 121.4 gigawatts of solar making its way through the major interconnection queues across the country. A whopping 83.3 gigawatts of this 121.4 gigawatts um, first entered the queues in 2016, uh, presumably prompted in part by the extension of the 30% ITC at the end of 2015. As you can see in the main graph here, uh, this very strong growth in the queues is distributed fairly evenly throughout the country with all regions except for perhaps the Northwest uh, seeing a huge influx of solar into their queues. Now, of course, not all of these projects will ultimately be built, 
um, being in the queues is a necessary step towards, but certainly does not guarantee project completion. And there's obviously a lot of uncertainty out there now uh, surrounding the Section 201 trade case, the DOE base load NOPR, and even the uh, prospect of tax reform, uh, none of which really existed at the end of uh, 2016, or at least not to any uh, great extent when these numbers were pulled. But uh, setting all those uncertainties aside uh, for a minute, the amount of solar growth suggested by this graph is still pretty astounding. Um, the inset graph in particular clearly demonstrates that we are, uh, that we seem to be moving towards a solar, wind, and gas world within, uh, with a few other things like storage uh, sprinkled in as well. And this is a uh, very different picture than we saw just a few years ago. So the pace of change in this market has been very rapid uh, with some significant implications. And going forward, we hope to be able to continue to track this market and bring you additional updates uh, like this one. So with that, I'd like to uh, extend our thank you to the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy's Sunshine Initiative for supporting this work. And let's now turn to some questions and hopefully some answers. So, Yo, do you want to uh, kick things off with a question or two? Yes, thank you, uh, Mark. Before doing that, I just want to reemphasize quickly that the uh, recording of this webinar will be posted on our website. And on that website, uh, which is emp.lbl.gov slash utility dash scale dash solar, uh, you can also find a full written report, um, the slides from today, and an Excel uh, data uh, file that has summary statistics. And in addition to that, we also have some visualizations of some of the data. Uh, so just check out that uh, website if you want to. In terms of uh, questions, um, we have had one question or two questions that dealt with uh, dual access tracking projects and whether we could speak a little bit more about it and how they compare to a single access and tracking projects in terms of um, costs and ubiquity. Unfortunately, it's uh, somewhat difficult for us to do so simply because in the utility scale market, as we define it here with projects larger than five megawatts AC, we recently haven't really seen much uh, of a dual access um, build out, but the, the market is really dominated by single access tracking systems. There are a few projects in uh, Texas by OCI that uh, use the dual access tracking uh, function, but those are really the only ones. Those are big projects, uh, several hundred megawatts. Um, but in terms of overall number of projects, uh, those are just like three or four or five or so. So really limited. So it's, it's difficult to really compare on a big scale those tracking costs of those few projects with uh, all the costs of the single access tracking projects. What we've seen when looking at these few projects is that uh, the upfront um, capital costs have been uh, quite, a, quite a bit higher. And I think that is one of the reasons um, why there are so few of them in comparison to single access tracking projects. I've not done a systematic analysis of uh, O&M costs, um, and I don't think that we have any utilities that actually cover those um, that report O&M costs to us. Uh, one of the drawbacks of having such limited O&M sample, we'd love to get more data there, but it's, it's just really difficult to get a, a hand on that. Um, so I think that's, uh, that speaks to uh, dual access tracking projects. I know that in the Northeast there are quite a few of those, but they are smaller than five megawatts AC and thus are not captured um, by, by our sample and we have not collected data for them. Hey, Yo, know, the, there was also another question that I saw um, related to this one asking about uh, whether we have any information on the distribution between um, tracking systems that are uh, purely horizontal in nature, so kind of um, uh, no tilt at all whatsoever to them. They just go east and west each day uh, versus those that are horizontal trackers but that are tilted somewhat southward. And um, the answer to that question is uh, I don't think we do have a good breakdown on that. For the most part, the uh, single axis tracking has been kind of purely horizontal single axis tracking, so no, no tilt whatsoever to the modules, no, no southward tilt. Um, but there have been a few 
Um, SunPower, for example, I think made a, what they called a T20 tracker that had a 20 degree um, um, tilt towards the south. There have been a few projects installed using that technology, but for the most part, the market has gone purely towards the zero degree horizontal uh, tracking. Yeah, um, it's uh, that getting that kind of data is somewhat difficult because it's not often discussed in press statements um, or annual reports by um, uh, project developers or descriptions on the home pages of um, project developers. The EIA has now started to uh, collect that data via their uh, annual form 860. Um, and we've looked at the data a little bit, but it seems uh, still quite inconsistent in terms of data quality. Um, but maybe something we could look at uh, in, in the future. Um, one other a group of questions that we've received here um, uh, highlights the fact that uh, some of these upfront capital costs uh, seem to be quite high in an international uh, comparison, um, highlighting uh, some of the recent uh, LCOE estimates in the Middle East, um, where the LCOE was just $15 per, um, per megawatt hour, and asked whether we could comment a little bit about the general costs. Um, uh, on upfront terms and LCOE terms between the United States and some other regions in, in the world. It's definitely an interesting uh, field that we are interested in learning more about. However, it's quite difficult to actually get uh, good data for uh, regions outside of the United States. I've been looking around um, for uh, data collections on system costs in other parts of uh, the world, and uh, so far we've not really been able to find really high quality data that comprises um, many systems in other parts uh, of the world. If any of you have um, data sources there, we'd be keen on learning more uh, about that, but for the most part it seems um, quite uh, anecdotal in, in, uh, for, for other regions outside of the U.S. Uh, reports of um, uh, low costs, and um, we don't really have access in a systematic manner to um, many um, reports. But um, one complicating factor in the comparison, um, especially when it comes to recent press statements about record low uh, LCOE levels, is and that's important in general in our report, is that our sample is backwards looking and thus uh, does not reflect um, projects that are currently um, being um, built. And uh, some of those uh, tenders in the Middle East, uh, I believe uh, their actual online date will be a couple years out. Um, and it's important to realize that those projects have not actually been built, and so it's uh, still not quite clear whether or not they will be able to achieve their uh, very uh, aggressive uh, cost uh, targets. I don't know, yeah. Mark, whether you want to add anything more to that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would just add to you know s some of the, the very low uh, PPA bids that we've seen coming out of the, the I guess the Middle Eastern area. Um, uh, there's obviously some uncertainties there um, about how these projects are being financed, but there is some speculation that some of the um, uh, so sovereign wealth funds over in that area are being kind of funneled into these projects, resulting in a very low cost of finance, which in turn can help to reduce the uh, PPA price. Um, so one question that I saw here, someone asked uh, what we meant by long duration storage. And so I'll just quickly clarify that. Um, so far we've seen um, four, four projects out there that have announced uh, PPAs uh, for both PV, including long duration storage. And uh, in all four cases, well, in three of the four cases, uh, we're talking about four hour storage and the fourth one was five hours. And the size of the batteries, uh, the capacity has ranged from, uh, I believe 10 to 30 megawatts. So by long duration, we're talking, you know, really just a few hours, four to five hour shift. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one question that uh, came up was uh, whether or not the prices that we've talked about in, includes any kind of uh, subsidy payments or the ITC, so if it's pre or post ITC. And uh, the prices that we have here represent the 
um, the cost of a project or the, the payment that would be exchanged at an arm length uh, transaction between a project uh, developer and uh, then project owner. So um, uh, the actual cost after receiving a payment would be lower than the prices that we have um, shown here. Okay, someone else asked about uh, whether we think the potentially higher module prices that, that uh, could result from the trade case, depending on how it's resolved, um, could those be enough to cause a turnaround and reduction in the inverter loading ratios, thereby resulting in lower capacity factors uh, in the future? And you know that is one distinct possibility. Um, to some extent, the inverter loading ratio is driven by the ratio between module prices and inverter prices. And so, um, and you know, one reason we've seen it increase over the past few years is because module prices have come down more quickly than inverter prices. So if that trend were to reverse, we could very well see a, a reduction in the ILR, which would, as the, as the questioner implied, uh, that would have a negative impact on capacity factors going forward. Uh, one other uh, question uh, that has come up, or a group of questions that have come up, deal, deals with O and M costs, and to what extent we believe that uh, O and M costs provide um, potential for LCOE reductions uh, in the future, or whether we believe um, that O and M costs for existing projects are going to increase um, quite a bit over the coming years as the projects age. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really have uh, good data with the uh, O&M costs that are uh, currently reported by uh, in, in the FIRC Form 1 forms. That doesn't really allow uh, for um, very good distinction here because the um, project uh, sample size for, for that part of our analysis is just um, really small. Uh, but when, when looking at the industry uh, overall and, you know, the uh, presentations at um, the big industry conference, it seems that there is a lot of attention uh, in the O&M space and uh, a lot um, of companies are very active in that space, uh, emphasizing their ability to uh, really streamline uh, analytical data and switching uh, to preventive um, O&M um, management. So um, if you would trust those companies, you may believe that there are um, potentials for, for their O&M um, cost reductions in, in the future. Of course, there's always a trade-off between, on the one hand, decreasing your O&M costs while not compromising um, the project's reliability. Okay, we had, uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in the, in the trade case here. So, someone else asked, um, basically for, for the projects that are in the queues, that you know, 121 gigawatts of solar that's currently in the queues, um, whether we have any idea of what percentage of those projects already have solar panels in hand or uh, otherwise have signed contracts for panels. <clears throat> um, the implication being that you know, if, if the tariffs go through, uh, a lot of those projects could drop out. And uh, the, you know, the short answer is we really don't have any, any clue um, which of those projects uh, have panels or have contracted for panels versus have not. So um, yeah, there's clearly uh, quite a bit of uncertainty and speculation among the amount of capacity uh, in the queues at present. And we probably have time for maybe one more. You know, I don't know if you see one there. Yeah, one, one quick question maybe that pertains to the solar value uh, calculation that we've done for KAISO. Um, somebody was interested where the price data and the solar generation data came from. And that uh, data is uh, reported by KAISO itself. Um, the actual interface on KAISO is somewhat buggy and a little difficult to work with. We've um, uh, worked with a data service uh, from ABB that aggregates the data and makes it a little easier to analyze. But um, all that uh, data is available um, for free out there for the general public as well, To um, if you are interested in repeating this kind of analysis. Uh, overall, 
it's um, somewhat difficult to extend this analysis to other regions of the United States outside of the uh, organized ISO markets um, because uh, you do not have wholesale prices that are reported publicly there. So um, I think it would be very interesting to extend this analysis to other regions in the Southwest, for example, Arizona uh, or Nevada that uh, also have quite a high uh, solar penetration already, but that is unfortunately a little bit more difficult. Um, and, 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 and that is something that we're hoping to look into in the coming year. So you know, maybe we'll have um, a little bit more to share on that next year. So I think uh, with that, we are, our, our time is now up. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And just a reminder that uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our website within the next uh, few days, I would imagine. So thanks, everybody, and have a great day.